Good afternoon, everyone. I am Atif Mia, and it is my privilege to welcome you all to our 10th annual conference on behalf of the Julius Rabinovitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton. The uh, Julius Rabinovitz Center is devoted to improving our understanding of the connections between financial markets and the economy. And towards this end, the center supports research, teaching, and meaningful conversations between faculty, students, and the policy community at large. The annual conference that we are here for is an important tradition for us here at the center. It is a time for all the old as well as the new friends to get together and engage in some of the important questions facing the global economy. This year, our theme is healing the big fractures in the economy, politics, and society. We are going to focus on how to bring about big, that is structural change in both our politics and the economy, a question that is of real and urgent significance. Our focus today, this is a two day conference and our focus today, the first day of the conference is going to be on politics. And tomorrow we will shift more towards the economy. We have a great lineup of uh, speakers and panelists. We are very fortunate that a number of people have joined us and I hope you enjoy the conversation as well. To get things started, it is my honor to hand over the floor to my colleague, Elder Shafir. Elder is a professor of psychology and public affairs at Princeton. He is a leading scholar in psychology and author of the recent and celebrated book, Scarcity, Why Having Too Little, means so much. Over to you, Elder. Thank you, Atif. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today and to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Jay Van Bevel. Uh, Jay is an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at NYU. He's also affiliated with the Stern Business School and directs uh, his own social identity and morality lab. Jay received his PhD at the University of Toronto and did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Ohio State University before he joined NYU uh, about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, Jay's research looks at how collective challenges, group identity, moral values, political beliefs, uh, shape both our brain and our behavior. Uh, among other things, he studies social motivation, cooperation, implicit bias, uh, decision-making, and moral judgment. He uses many methods ranging from neuroimaging, uh, brain lesion patients, social and cognitive tasks, cross-cultural comparisons, uh, even linguistic analyses uh, and social media communications. Jay has authored uh, many, many academic publications. He's also written extensively for more popular press, and he's worked very hard at disseminating behavioral insights at a variety of policy and academic uh, fora. He's received many awards, I won't list them all, but in, they include the Young Investigator Award from the Society for Social Neuroscience, a Young Scholars Award from the Foundation of Personality and Social Psychology, uh, several early career awards, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think uh, in this age, uh, in our current age of COVID and political polarization and growing inequality and increasing racial awareness and grave environmental threats, I think many of us on this uh, meeting today are really confronted with the challenge of transforming academic research into more applicable and real uh, change-making work. And I think certainly at that, uh, at that cross border, this uh, challenge, Jay has really been at the forefront. He's really tried very hard to think of how we apply these things to benefit uh, recent societal challenges. And it's a real honor to introduce him today. Uh, Jay will talk uh, for about uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes. We'll have uh, until 1.10 to, to entertain some questions. I'll try to select some as we go. And then from Jay's talk, we'll uh, entertain the rest of the day and we'll focus mostly on issues of polarization, uh, partisanship, post-truth politics, and misinformation uh, should be a wonderful day. So having said that, uh, Jay, it's an honor and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Eldar. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to ask a quick question. Uh, can people see my screen? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to make sure it plays. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you uh, about something that's been on my mind, and, and surely everyone who's watching this on your mind as well. Um, the role of identity 
as we deal with this global pandemic uh, that we're all stuck in. Obviously, this virtual conference is evidence that we're all trying to figure out how to deal with the uh, devastating situation we're in. And this is something that is happening as a shared reality for people around the globe. Um, as, I, as we started in the early stages of the pandemic, um, I wanted to understand the behavioral science behind what was going on. And I turned to this great paper uh, on the behavioral science of the last global bet pandemic of this magnitude, the Spanish flu. It was published in Science Magazine over a hundred years ago. And so this was really before a lot of the behavioral science that we think of as, you know, the core of the fields that work, many of us work in, certainly in psychology and behavioral economics. Um, but even then, there was already an understanding that uh, psychology and behavioral decision making was a challenge during a pandemic. Um, and in particular, this paper pointed out three lessons from uh, the Spanish flu. The first was that people do not always appreciate the risks they run, um, that it goes against human nature for people to shut themselves up in rigid isolation as a means of protecting other. You know, all of our instincts are designed to be social. We are social animals. Um, and it's one of the core features of our species, but also one of the ways that we promote, you know, uh, well-being in terms of our mental and physical health. Isolation is in incredibly challenging and damaging for people over a long period of time. And then finally, that a lot of this is happening unconsciously. Um, we make decisions unconsciously that put ourselves at risk or others. And a uh, key feature of this in the current pandemic is when people are asymptomatic. They're going around without knowing it, putting other people at risk. And so understanding this behavioral science element of how disease spreads uh, was fundamental to understanding what happened during that pandemic. And we thought it was uh, fundamental to what might under, uh, help us understand our pandemic. And so uh, when we think of these at scale, what we're talking about is collective behavior. So um, it's not enough for any one of us to do the right thing during the pandemic. Um, it won't prevent the disease uh, from spreading and from people from dying. We all need to do it across a number of different behaviors. Um, and so this is one of my favorite gifts from the early days of the pandemic, pointing out that you need a huge collective response and it needs to be sustained where a bunch of people make decisions and sacrifices that benefit not only them, but the people around them. And if we all do it, then we all accrue benefits. And so this is really a social dilemma, uh, especially before the vac vaccination was here. And I'm gonna argue that this is also relevant to the vaccination. And so this is from a paper we started writing in March. Um, and I believe it was published in April of last year. And what we did is we combined a number of social and behavioral science scientists to try to understand what we might predict were gonna be the big issues uh, in the current pandemic. And we talked about you know, how we perceive threats and react to them, issues of prejudice and discrimination, inequality and racism. Uh, we also talked about isolation and loneliness and the stress and, and need to cope with it, um, as well as things uh, that are really kind of in the heart of, of my research, which are things like how you're gonna deal with politics and polarization. Is that gonna be a risk factor for the spread of the pandemic in a place that's highly polarized like the US? Um, as well as key issues like leadership. What types of leadership styles prove to be effective at mobilizing collective behavior and which ones prove to be ineffective? Um, and so we wanted to summarize the literature on this, but of course, this was before we really had any behavioral or social science research on uh, the particular pandemic, COVID-19. And so we were drawing from the previous literature and trying to triangulate across all these fields to see what we could find as kind of consensus issues and, and key suggestions that might, might help a little bit. And so there's a lot in this paper, but I'm just gonna point to a couple of th key things you're gonna see in this talk. Um, one is that there's a need for cooperation, that individual and collectivist interests are sometimes at, at odds and it produces a social dilemma. You need to solve that in a society to get people who might want to go, uh, you know, travel and visit their family for the holidays, um, but then they put not only all their family at risk, but the rest of society when they come back. Um, and how are you gonna get trust and compliance? What, what works among leaderships? How can they promote a shared purpose and identity and elevate uh, the interests of the group without derogating uh, you know, minorities, uh, which you saw that happen in, in many places around the world. Um, and then the key other thing here that I'm gonna talk about is um, issues of political polarization and social norms. So how leaders signal social norms and citizens do um, might depend on things like political polarization. Who we look to for norms might be very different depending on how we identify in our society. And then this is of course amplified when you have conspiracy theories and, and misinformation and fake news spreading. Um, and the WHO has called this 
crisis during the pandemic an infodemic, that it's its own uh, challenge that we're gonna have to face as a society. And I think it's gonna be a challenge going forward for other crises, including climate change, all kinds of things are gonna have to overcome this issue of misinformation. And so uh, enough about my research, when we look out in the world, um, we've been able to see really compelling differences in how leaders have approached the pandemic. Um, and, and maybe one of the starkest contrasts is between New Zealand's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, and uh, Donald Trump. And I, I point out this contrast, not just because journalists have pointed it out, uh, but Trump himself has pointed it out. And so he's gone on the record and criticized New Zealand for their big surge in COVID-19. Um, uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister has called those remarks patently wrong. And so I'll show you what, what the data says, uh, but also I want to draw attention to their different styles of leadership. Um, one tends to be highly divisive uh, and pretty, you know, mixed messages, and I'm going to show you some of those, and, and skeptical of what some of the experts said, um, and also skeptical of what leaders were doing in different parts of the country, you know, specifically in democratic states, lock, lockdowns were criticized by the president. Uh, on the other hand, in New Zealand, uh, Jacinda Ardern has been famous for calling uh, New Zealanders her team of five million people and um, doing things like she went after they uh, flattened the curve initially, uh, she went out for brunch and they didn't have enough seats because they had distanced all the seats in the brunch restaurant and she was going to leave uh, rather than, you know, going in for the photo op, which you might expect from many uh, national leaders and uh, refused to go in until other people had left and, and it was safe. And so she was role modeling and embodying the the guidelines that she suggested were critical for public safety. So putting herself on the level of citizens in terms of what she should do and what's expected of them. So I'm just gonna show you some of this messaging. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. We think we have it very well under control. We pretty much shut it down coming in from China. You know, in April, supposedly it dies with the hotter weather when it gets warm. Uh, historically that has been able to kill the virus. The people are getting better, they're all getting better. And the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. And you'll be fine. Uh, they're going to have vaccines, I think, relatively soon. Not only the vaccines, but the therapies. Therapies is sort of another word for cure. You're talking about very small numbers in the United States. Our numbers are lower than just about anybody. It's really working out. And a lot of good things are going to happen. And we are responding with great speed and professionalism. It's going to go away. Yeah, no, I don't take responsibility at all. We're going to all be great. We're going to be so good. This came up. It, it came up so suddenly. This is a pandemic. I felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic. All you had to do is look at other countries. The coronavirus, you know that, right? Coronavirus. And this is their new hoax. We're 15 people in this massive country. And because of the fact that we went early, we went early. We could have had a lot more than that. We're doing great. Our country is doing so great. Okay, so this was at, you know, this, our, this commercial was cut at a time when we had 5,000 cases in the US. Uh, now we have over 500 or roughly 500,000 deaths, depending on uh, what source you go by. And so this just yeah, shows you the, the scope of this. Um, but I'm gonna give some, credit to Trump, but the, his last comments uh, where he calls the coronavirus a hoax were spliced together um, in, in a way that might be misrepresenting uh, what his belief is. He re it refers to the coronavirus as a new hoax, where he was really referring to the word hoax as uh, democratic concerns and criticisms of his administration's handling of the outbreak rather than uh, the virus itself. Uh, but this gives you a sense of how this has been polarized, even the, the language he used, but the criticisms of him. Um, and Joe Biden, uh, over a year ago, long before he was even the Democratic nominee, uh, wrote an article in the USA Today uh, criticizing Trump and saying he was going to be the worst possible leader to deal with this long before it was actually a, a pandemic in the US. And so um, this has been filtered through the lens of many of our national issues, through the lens of polarization um, and, uh, you know, one side dismissing it, the other side taking it very seriously and then criticizing them. And, and so this has been filtered through the way so many issues have. It's also been filtered, as these issues tend to be, through hyper-partisan news sources. And so um, Fox News, especially in the early days of the pandemic, covered it very differently. And, and not just Fox News in general, there is research suggesting that if you watched Sean Hannity, you were far less concerned about the virus in January and February and early March than if you watch, say, Tucker Carlson, where both 
primetime, very popular uh, news hosts. And so it gets filtered by these news sources and even the hosts who some of them dismiss it more than others. And so this is just part of a general societal trend where the country has polarized, the politicians have polarized, the media is hyperpolarized. And as you can see with this uh, GIF, uh, individuals have polarized. And I, I saw data yes yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before on Twitter, you'll see this hopefully in the discussion section, that 2020 has the highest levels of affective polarization in the US in 40 years. Um, and, and this is largely driven by outgroup hate, which by some measures is now a stronger force than in-party love. And it's almost entirely accounted for this increase in dis disdain between the two parties in the country. Um, and so this is worse than it has been in 40 years and continues on a, uh, on a downward trend, at least up until last year. Um, and so what's happening, this is where my research is, what's the psychology of this? The psychology, we argue, is that when you see information that's presented a certain way, um, for many people, not for all, but for hyper-partisan individuals, of which more and more of us fall in that category, it gets filtered through these identities because we wanna to belong to the group. We want our group to win or attain status. It might make us feel good about our value system if our group does better or pushes forth policies that we think are, are morally virtuous. It also helps us understand the world, fulfilling our epistemic goals. And when these goals are really strong and they outweigh our goals for accuracy, um, it can lead us to interpret things or at least express different beliefs about uh, what's going on. And so you saw this in the early days of the pandemic, right around the time uh, that, you know, Trump, after Trump was making all those statements, that it seemed to have an impact on how average citizens uh, were expressing concern about the pandemic. So even though in, in places that were hit hard early, like Washington State, New York State, New Jersey, um, those people in those states were more concerned than people from uh, other states that were not hit hard. Um, the biggest difference here was just partisanship. So there was not a single uh, state where Democrats were less concerned than Republicans. So even in states that were not really touched at all, uh, the Democrats took it more seriously than the most devastated uh, Republican, Republican groups in states that have been hit hard. And so, um, so there was some suggestion, maybe this was just expressive identity, that people actually didn't believe this or that, that these needs might collapse as you know, the media covers this and we start to take it seriously. Um, and so when there's a really interesting analysis of people's Google searches, which is more of their private expressions of what they're thinking, um, searching for things like hand sanitizer uh, was highly polarized with Democrats searching more uh, during the early stages of the pandemic. But even a couple weeks later, you saw the polarization go away. And it suggests maybe Republicans by the end of March were starting to take it more seriously, at least with hand sanitizer. And so with, with all of this data coming in, uh, I wrote an op-ed saying, if this continues, this is going to be a huge problem. This could kill people. Um, you know, polarization and interpretations of crowd sizes don't matter, of course. They, they're, they're politically significant, but they don't affect people's uh, life or death. But, but when you have uh, something like this, like a virus, a pandemic being filtered through that lens, can be can come incredibly devastating. And so I made a bunch of predictions what was going to happen, but of course we didn't have the data and we didn't know how seriously to take the polls um, because of things like that Google search data. And so uh, uh, Anton Golitzer, who is a graduate student at Yale, contacted me and said he has data from 15 million smartphones per day, um, every day for weeks and weeks and weeks. And we could see in you know, red counties versus blue counties, red states versus blue, blue states, um, were people following social distance guidelines, which were really the key way that that public health officials were suggesting uh, we can fight back against this in, in March and April and May. And um, as you know, this has been really critical for epidemiologists to track the spread of the virus by tracking mobility of individuals between countries and within countries. And so we were able to use this technology. Um, critically, this is anonymized. So we're not using any individual's private data here. We can see movement at the county level, um, but not individual cell phones. And I'll just give you a scope of what this looks like uh, and this, the 0% here means that movement hasn't changed over the last year. Um, and so as you see increases over time from March into April, what that means is people are engaging in more distancing. And when you see those little bumps, uh, those are weekends because it's easier to distance on weekends than some people just have to go into work, they're essential workers. Um, and what you can see is that people are engaging in more and more distancing through March and April, but by Memorial Day weekend in late May, it's kind of gone back to baseline. It's nice out, people are, ready to go outside. Uh, at that time, the curve had flattened somewhat. Um, but once you break this down by uh, Democrat versus Republican states or counties, 
the, the, the analysis suggests the same thing, no matter how we carve out the data. Um, but when we broke it down into the 3,000 counties, which give us the most uh, precision and statistical power, what we found is that there was a significant and stubborn partisan gap in that people from Democratic counties were engaging in more distancing than people from Republican counties. Um, and depending on how we measured just a reduction of overall movement or just reduction in visiting non-essential services, this gap persisted um, even as the curve flattened. And in fact, if we found a trend here, it was against what I had predicted, which is that I, I thought as people more and more learn about the pandemic and its risks and it affects their states, you might have a reality constraint and you get rid of the partisan gap. If anything, uh, on these metrics, the partisan gap got bigger over time. Uh, and so but when you quantify it, um, what the data suggested is that counties that voted for Trump over Clinton in 2016 exhibited 14% less spatial distancing uh, around the country. And um, to make it even worse, the reddest counties had the lowest spatial distancing and the bluest counties had the most. So it wasn't just if you read or blue the way that we normally talk about it put in, in the media, it was the extent to which you supported Trump predicted not following the guidelines and the extent to which you supported uh, Clinton and your, your county did uh, predicted following the guidelines even more. And so there's a degree here, a continuous degree of, of uh, following the guidelines. We also found that this seemed to be accounted for largely by what media you followed. So if you're in a county that watched a lot of Fox News, um, you were essentially uh, not engaging in distancing. If you watch other mainstream media like CNN, MSNBC, you tended to be engaging in more distancing. Um, and so again, this, these impacts of leaders are filtered or amplified uh, by mainstream media. And then if you look, you know, our data ended in end of uh, May, but if you look in, over the summer and in the fall, what you could see is that this, if anything, became amplified. Um, and so you're seeing now infections in uh, red states, especially solid or likely Republican states, are spiking uh, through the late summer and well into the fall. Um, and this is what we found is that places, counties, and states that didn't follow the distancing in our data, you know, a couple weeks later, we're reporting higher infections. And then about another week after that, we're, uh, they were reporting greater mortality. And so again, our data is correlational, um, but it suggests really powerfully that these have consequences uh, that are life and death. Um, and if anything, this has been amplified, you know, over time in lots of different measures. And, and it was the case at first, especially I'm, I'm in New York City, we were hit the hardest and, and Washington State and California were hit the hardest. But over time, this has completely reversed in large part because people don't seem to be actually taking this seriously. And, and this isn't just distancing, you're seeing the same thing, obviously with risk perceptions, with mask wearing. And the gap has, again, gotten bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Uh, even as people have come face to face or potentially known family and friends who have uh, been affected by this or been infected by it. Um, and I'll say this happens in my family too. I have family who are insisting this is not a real thing. And it almost is perfectly predicted by their politics. Um, and, and this has a spillover effect in all kinds of places. Um, and you're seeing this, one of these other places is Congress. Uh, there was data in the New York Times recently that tracked all the members of the Senate and House of Representatives who contracted uh, coronavirus. And you can see more than twice as many people who have contracted it are Republicans versus Democrats, even though they potentially have the resor incredible resources, access to public health expertise uh, to, to stop this from happening. And, and my concern is not just that this has been a disaster thus far, that this fracture is mirrored in current uh, vaccination hesitancy. So this was a recent Gallup panel uh, up to last month. And what they found is that partisanship is now the biggest predictor of vaccine attitudes in the US. It's bigger than age, it's bigger than gender, it's bigger than race, it's bigger than education. And so um, this doesn't seem to be going away. Um, and, and one question of course is why? You know, I have colleagues who study political ideology, others who study partisanship. Is this an, something about belief systems? Is this something about identity? Um, and, and one clue about this is if you go back to Ebola, you saw the exact opposite pattern, that Republicans were more concerned about Ebola than Democrats. And, and of course, that was during a period where Obama was president. So it suggests it's more about who's the leader um, is, is changing these attitudes uh, for, for Republicans and potentially Democrats, it suggests it's more about partisanship than ideology. And so it, to the extent that you have polarization, there's gonna be difference in trust and concern uh, about whatever the crisis is. Um, so, in the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you about a study that uh, we're, we're doing around the world, thinking about what might address some of these partisan fractures that we see in all these domains of society. 
Um, and I'll go back to New Zealand. Some countries have managed to do this. And so if you see, you know, although uh, Trump had criticized New Zealand for a surge, if you plot, and I just did this an hour ago, you plot the deaths in New Zealand from coronavirus, um, even as of today, there's 26 deaths there for the whole country of 5 million people and, and nearly 500,000 in the United States. And so, and, and of course, if you adjust for population, it's still orders of magnitude in terms of difference. And so I mentioned that she has different, you know, a more of a appeal to national identity and sense of purpose and shared sacrifice in, in her messaging. But of course, we don't know if it's just something special about her or, you know, New Zealand's on an island and maybe that makes it easier. Um, maybe, but is there something to this notion of uh, collective unity? And what we had suggested in our original paper we wrote in March um, was that leaders that were effective were very much going to do what Jacinda Ardern did. They're going to appeal to um, promote trust leading to cooperation by appealing to a shared sense of social identity amongst their followers. Um, and so maybe people who feel that shared sense of identity or purpose in a nation, uh, which in this pandemic has been largely addressed at the nation level in most countries, um, in terms of policy and border shutting, we, we thought that might be effective. Um, and of course, we just want to say that when, when I say national identification, people uh, get concerned because they know that national identity is also associated with some pretty dark elements of human nature. Um, what that dark element of human nature is at a psychological level is often what's referred to as collective narcissism. And so this is where you think uh, you have a belief, an inflated belief in national greatness, you're super defensive about your country, um, and you're more defensive about your country's image uh, than you actually care about its citizens. And there's lots of studies suggesting things like, you know, uh, when we think of like prejudice or, or nationalism in a way that derogates other countries, that seems to be driven by this uh, collective narcissism. Once you adjust for that, a national identification usually just predicts positive attitudes towards other nations. You know, you can think of like the Olympic Village as being national identification, people from all these countries competing and getting along. Uh, and you can think of like collective narcissism as, as countries at war. This is where you really despise other countries. And so we measured this, I, I opened this call for people around the world to join us in a study to study these things uh, and, and other things and see what, what is predicting people's willingness to abide by distancing, hygiene, and, and uh, policy support around the world. So we got uh, people joined us from 67 countries and translated forward and backward, translated our, our measures. Um, and we analyzed it. Our paper is currently uh, under review. And this gives you a sense of the country. So we weren't fully representative of the globe, but we had data from five continents, which is, for me, much more global and representative of humanity than anything I've ever done. Uh, and what we were able to do is see, it, you know, across countries, what predicts people's willingness to follow these guidelines, not just in New Zealand or the US. And here's what we found. And the different colors of the dots are um, support for uh, reducing physical contact, report, uh, policy support for like closed borders, uh, hygiene, like washing your hands and avoiding people. Um, and what you can see on the y-axis um, is the countries. And on the x-axis on the bottom, you see the strength of these relationships with national identification. And so up in the top of Denmark, the more you identify as, you highly identify nationally with Denmark and you're a citizen there, the more you're willing to do all of these. Um, and actually that was a trend on almost every measure in every country around the world. There's only a few tiny exceptions, uh, but the coefficient in almost every country was positive for all three measures. Uh, with national identification. So this turned out to be an incredibly robust predictor of the willingness to follow these public health guidelines around the globe. And this gives you a sense of national identification, which is the top row of maps. Uh, and so you see that there's red in every country that we measured, which means there's strong or moderate, modest to positive, uh, positive support of, of various strength in every country we measured pretty much on every measure. Um, you can see with national narcissism, which is the next row of maps, that in many countries, including the US and Brazil, um, this was a predictor of not following the guidelines, uh, especially the contact or spatial distancing guidelines. So the more uh, you had this inflated sense and defensive sense of your national identity, the less you were willing to follow the guidelines. And so in this case, even though national narcissism and identification are sometimes correlated, often correlated, once you pull them apart, they're doing opposite things in many countries. Um, and in political ideology it was a weak predictor on average, uh, but it tended to be, if you were slightly more liberal, you supported at least policy change, uh, although not really much else. So the real story here was national identification was a robust predictor around the globe. And so I'll just wrap up. What this suggests 
is uh, that this might be a really important thing to think about and potentially harness. And it's really at odds with polarization, which is about party identity rather than national unity and identity and purpose. Um, and, and you, again, I'll just say the US, but you've seen this in Brazil, you saw this a bit in the UK, which has had a uh, really hard time handling it. Um, at one point, the three countries in the world that had the highest level of infections and mortality were three of the most polarized countries uh, in the world. And, and you can see this also in the modeling of, you know, this was, I think the White House hosted four, three or four outbreaks on official events, which are violating the guidelines. You see people not wearing masks, crowded in for the Supreme Court nomination. Uh, just to be clear, the mechanism, the primary mechanism of transmission is aerosol. So I don't want to give you the false uh, assumption that this is all from the outside. Most of these people were inside later celebrating, and I suspect that's where it spread, but in, inside almost none of them had masks on. Um, and so when you have polarization, you have messages like this, symbols, communication, media, it's an incredibly dangerous thing, uh, especially when your leaders are downplaying the risk. Um, and um, this has, as I said, been affected, of all, affected all kinds of things about protests, uh, in fact, one of the biggest, uh, a colleague of mine, Gordon Pennycook, found one of the biggest predictors of the insurrection, uh, support for the insurrection on January 6th, was uh, believing in conspiracy theories about COVID. And so this misinformation and this polarization of misinformation seems to be part of a common construct that's predicting all these other sources of conflict. And I just want to say, and, and I'll, I'll give a shout out, I'm Canadian, uh, that it's, Canadians are polarized too. And that there was a really interesting study where uh, a number of scholars, political scientists, analyzed the rhetoric of, of Canadian politicians on social media and found that they were all pretty similarly concerned, whether they were liberal or conservative. And so then in national surveys, you saw Canadians were on average similarly concerned. Um, and so it suggests that even in a context of polarization, if you get leadership that, and their messaging is the same, creates a common sense of purpose, you can be more effective. And there was one analysis uh, by Ezekiel Emanuel's lab at, at uh, Penn in the medical school, suggesting that if the US had just been as good as Canada, which admittedly wasn't perfect, they would have saved over 100,000 deaths. By now that might be two or 300,000 deaths. And so without much many other differences, um, you can have an enormous impact potentially through this messaging. And so I think that this is uh, uh, something that social identity suggests is a potential risk factor during pandemics, as we saw, uh, but also a potential opportunity if you can create a common sense of purpose. And I'll just uh, leave this up. If anybody is interested in accessing this national, international data, we're going to make it all available uh, as soon as our initial paper is in press. So very soon for people who, anyone who's interested. And I'm happy to take questions now from anybody. Thank you, Jay. Uh, bravo. So it's my task, I think, to channel the questions and to ask a couple of my own. Uh, let me start. Um, I'm going to push you a little bit since all of us uh, are masters of studies where people rely on confirmatory evidence. So let's talk for a moment about red versus blue states. Um, there was an article just the other day about the challenges of trying to explain California versus Florida. Yeah. where many things are similar, including all the COVID-related stats, except that Florida has been opening and celebratory and California has been shut down and depressed. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, um, the, I think disproportionate Democrat-Republican deaths, a couple of questions have, have asked about that. I think people are perplexed that the Northeast has a lower supply of vaccines. Um, you're right that the red states started lower and went higher, but on the other hand, they were lower before. I guess my question is, are we worried that the American population is, you know, disconcerted by the fact that scientists are not fully understanding it? And as a result, there's a license to, you know, choose your own way of acting. Yeah, I do want to acknowledge that that is potentially one of the problems. So very early on, the messaging around masks was incredibly confused. Um, some people even suggesting that it wasn't good. And uh, or that the mask should be saved for frontline workers. And so if you care about others, you should not get a mask. And so I think that when you create my model of, of how identity shapes beliefs and, and behaviors, that when things are ambiguous, that's when identity tends to drive behavior. When things are crystal clear, you tend to see less impact of identity on average. Um, maybe the pandemic at, towards the end is maybe a, a different case because being anti-masker then became a symbol of, of pro-Trump. Um, but I do think on, in general that that might have 
created this desire to uh, choose your own adventure or an affordance to choose your own adventure in how we responded to the pandemic. The other thing I want to say is that just because you're a blue state governor doesn't mean you are following the science. So I, I and I, I'm not an expert in California's policy, but a couple points when I checked in on it, they had policies that were like shutting down parks and outdoor dining and things. And so, um, as I said, alluded to in my talk, by then we knew that the primary mechanism of transmission was aerosol. And, and New York all summer had all these restaurants open. If you live in New York like me, it's like all the dining was outdoors. And, and it was really great. I went out all the time uh, to dine. I, wouldn't, I haven't gone indoors to a restaurant in 12 months, but I've been outdoors constantly because it's like 20 times less risky if you're outdoors with somebody than indoors. And so I, I think that when, you sh when, when the policies actually don't mirror the science and are just incredibly restrictive, that you probably undercut support for and trust in the government and leadership. So I, I wonder if that's part of the problem in a place like California. Um, but I, I, I'm not enough of an expert in the internal politics there, but I remember there was a couple of cases where I can imagine it just being deeply irritating, even if you were a scientist, because the policies were really strict and rigid and didn't align with the science. Um, so, so that's another challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So following up on that, uh, there's a couple of questions. Um, you discussed national identity and, and narcissism. Uh, what about identity more locally? So uh, one person asks, uh, why are we calling denying science partisanship? I mean, what exactly is going on there? You know, where I come from, Israel, the new problem now is that all of a sudden people are refusing the vaccine because it's associated with the prime minister. Yeah. That just seems sort of, you know, we need you to explain that. <laughs> yeah, and I think that is partly partisanship. Uh, the U.S. cases, so I think the partisanship in the U.S. is confounded a little bit with populism and the same with Brazil and a little bit in England and possibly in, in Israel, I don't know. Um, and so when you ha have a populist leader, uh, again, at one point in time, when I looked, I think The Economist have an article suggesting populism is the key big, big, big predictor of countries that were struggling with this. And so at that point, you not only usually have polarization with populism, but you also have anti-science rhetoric and anti-elitism and distrust of, of uh, experts and authorities. And so I think that amplifies, or that might be like a, in some, some part, in some places, maybe the US, that's more of the active ingredient potentially. Um, in Israel, I, um, if people distrust, and this is where trust in the leader is key, even if you might otherwise be receptive to a vaccine, but you distrust the leader who's, who's advertising it or administering it, um, that can potentially dissuade people. And so there's been a couple papers I've seen recently looking at different messaging to reduce vaccine hesitancy. And one possibility is you get the, the leaders of the country on stage to take the vaccine. Um, and, and what you find in these studies, off a couple, I think one of them was a registered control trial, so rigorous studies, um, that that doesn't really help people that much. It doesn't really convince them if they're getting the messaging and the role model from the political leadership, especially if they don't trust that leader. Um, in that case, you want like experts and scientists and people who are seen as more impartial. Um, again, the problem with populism is it's partly designed to erode trust in institutions and nonpartisan sources of information and leadership in the media. So, so you have a deep... I mean, I yeah. don't pretend to think that I have a simple answer to that, but it, I, I think that's the issue here. I think the Israeli case, by the way, to the extent that I understand it is interesting. It's not so much a distrust. It's a lot of very young people now who are refusing. And apart from a small ultra-Orthodox community, the rest of them believe in science. I think it's almost a reluctance to reward or to allow the, the prime minister to gloat. It's a very interesting symbolic refusal. That's a thing a bit different from what, uh, you know, it's like you would refuse it here if, if Trump took full you know, pride in the success somehow. Yeah, I, I do wonder if we had an alternative world uh, where Trump had won re-election and was doing a constant victory lap about uh, the vaccinations, that if you would have more vaccination hesitancy among Democrats and that gap would either close or maybe reverse a bit. Um, yeah, that's I, I would not be surprised if it closed at least a little bit for sure. Uh, another question I wanted to ask you. So uh, Keris Starmer, the UK labor leader today in a speech, has argued that the coronavirus pandemic has hit the UK disproportionately hard because of 10 years of conservative rule and, and the, the, how they've weakened the foundations of our society. Uh, one person in the, in the Q&A here uh, refers to Robert Putnam's recent book, The Upswing, where a similar argument is made where excessive individualism is really interfering with more adaptive collective responses. And I guess the question to an expert like you is, you know, what do we do? We think that's part of it and what do we do about it? Um, 
yeah, easy so, questions. So, so we do have a section in our paper on that we thought that individualism versus collectivism might be a risk factor. And, and another cultural factor that uh, Michelle Gelfand, one of our co-author studies is tightness versus looseness of cultures. And she had a paper that came out a few weeks ago, maybe it's in the Lancet or New England Journal of Medicine, looking across countries and finding that tightness of culture is a predictor of a success at handling the pandemic, that you need people who are gonna follow norms and guidelines uh, in, in a way that doesn't just optimize freedom of, of choice. And so I, I do think that, you know, I, I love freedom. You know, I, I'm in this country, I, I love all of the things about, most of the things associated with freedom, uh, but it comes at a cost and, and it comes at a cost in certain situations. And this is one of those situations where uh, mentality of freedom, which was a big part of the protest and anti-masking uh, movement, also anti-vaxxing uh, part of the rhetoric for them, is that no one can force me to do this. And the fact that you do leads to almost like a, what we call in psychology is reactance. That when an authority tells you to do something, you're even less likely to do it. Some people, because they're trying to express their autonomy. And so, uh, and you see a lot of these, like, uh, you know, that snake for libertarianism at a lot, at the, you saw that at the inter insurrection, you've seen that a lot of anti-mask rallies. So I do think that's a big part of American culture. Um, and, and that was also uh, Trump's rhetoric on Twitter when he was telling people in states like Michigan to push back and against their governor when they were engaging in lockdowns to protect their freedoms. So, so I do think that's uh, a risk factor and has been throughout. And so there's intrinsic trade-offs to it. It comes with a lot of benefits, but, but man, when you're trying to solve social dilemmas, which is a pandemic is probably a classic case of a social dilemma, same with climate change, you're gonna have, uh, I think that's gonna be a risk factor for, for, for uh, 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 an inability to successfully address those collective issues. So, you know, going back to my to my introduction about how, you know, people like you try to move from, you know, the research to the applied, what do we do about the current conspiracy theories, the narrative that are permeating the water? Is there some strong proposal? <laughs> um, so, so there's lots of proposals and there's lots of people trying to deal with this. Uh, one thing you saw, obviously, um, is that Trump and 70,000 people spreading QAnon conspiracy theories were kicked off Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, after the pandemic. Um, and there's some data suggesting that conspiracy theories immediately were suppressed because there's a small number of people who do the vast majority of the spreading of misinformation. Um, again, that conflicts with values of individual freedom, especially free speech. Uh, and people are, are outraged about it. And there's also concerns about whether a small number of CEOs should dictate speech norms for the entire country. So I don't want to suggest that there's an easy answer, um, but insofar as you're dealing with misinformation, I think that has to be one solution. Another solution we've seen with the insurrection, and who knows if this will set precedents that scale for other problems, is um, lawsuits. So it turns out there's a legal and financial problem. I believe Fox News was sued by, by uh, people who had these voting, uh, I don't know if it was Dominion who sued them, um, but it was, I think, like a $2 billion, $2.7 billion lawsuit. And immediately they fired Lou Dobbs because he was one of the people spreading misinformation about voting. Um, and so there are these potential constraints and consequences. Uh, some of them are you lose your platform. Others are your, your company might not want to keep you around uh, if they're uh, as a financial liability. So I think that you're going to see more and more of that going forward. I also think that it was a Sandy Hook parent maybe who successfully sued Alex Jones mm -hmm. for spreading misinformation about the, the uh, school shooting in Sandy Hook. So I think people are adding that to the repertoire. I don't, I doubt that'll be a common thing, but maybe the threat of it, and I hate, you know, there's risks of litigious society that are hugely problematic. Um, so I don't want to deny those, but I can see that being a bigger arrow in the quiver of people fighting misinformation. So, I mean, all that notwithstanding, let's think for a moment, let's look for a moment at political leaders, you know, congressmen and congresswomen. When they endorse these lunatic narratives, I mean, are they, let's assume for a moment, not all of them believe it. Are they just really that cynical? I mean, they're seeing their citizens dying. They were presumably patriots once. How do we explain that? Is it just for self and, you know, for being elected? So, so I do, uh, normally I, I share your belief, Eldar, that, that, le that a lot of polit politicians are incredibly cynical and they're just moving towards whatever their next election is or keep the money flowing or whatever, make sure they don't get primaried in the next election. Um, and we've gerrymandered everything. So the incentive structure is towards not getting primaried, not towards it, 
you know, winning a close election. Um, so so I, I believe in that, except for in this case, it does look like there's a set of true believers in the sense that if you look at the infections of members of Congress or look at all the people that were not wearing masks at the like, indoors at the, after the Supreme Court nomination, um, these people, and, and after that the inter insurrection where all these members of Congress were taken underground to some like safe place to not get killed, um, Democrat members, Democratic members were asking Republican members to wear masks while they're all underground in this tiny space and they refused to. And so it, that suggests to me that there must be some deep true belief. And, and then I have to imagine that these people are embedded within their own echo chamber of watching their own favorite hyperpartisan news source going on to talking to their constituents who are already kind of are in a certain belief system, are getting feedback on social media that's positive when they push certain things, it's reinforcing certain beliefs for them. And so I, I can't help but think that there's a bunch of mechanisms that are actually creating true false beliefs in a deep way among leaders. And so we don't know where the line between cynicism ends and true belief begins with, with especially with political elites. They're usually playing a different game, but man, in this case, there's just so many data points suggesting that they truly believe a, a huge amount of the rhetoric they're spewing. Mm. Yeah, that's stunning. Um, you know, uh, an intuitive scientist would have thought that at a moment like this, when we see how much our health depends on, you know, essential workers, and by that I mean our, our kids' school bus drivers, the people who deliver the food, the people who mow our lawns and walk our dogs and whatever else is going on, you would think that, you know, the notion of, for example, keeping Americans without health insurance would be completely debunked, you know, disgusting. It doesn't seem to be happening entirely. Are people compartmentalizing? Are they planning to get over it quickly? Are they not moved? Yeah, so I, I have, so one big question, and this is where social science kind of ends, right? We're not very good at predicting what will socially happen after events. Um, we're good at describing under certain conditions might what might change, but we don't really know because it can go in a lot of ways. But I remember reading uh, somewhere that in Canada, that was one of the things that led to a change in support for public health care was the Spanish flu because it was so devastating. And, I, and I, I believe it started in Saskatchewan and then uh, Tommy Douglas was a politician who was a prime minister of Saskatchewan who mobilized, uh, you know, started the, the movement towards uh, national health care. And so it is possible that you can get change uh, in a circumstance like that, but it really takes people running with it and mobilizing and rallying around it. And so one hope of this is that we'll re-examine society and what the fractures were, what the flaws were. I saw data this morning also suggesting, you know, systemic racism, something we've known about, probably everybody on this call has known about for many years. Uh, many of us study it. Um, but it wasn't, that it really mobilized during the pandemic. And I saw data this morning suggesting that uh, African Americans, their life expectancy has plummeted by multiple years during the pandemic. And it's created an even wider uh, life longevity gap, a racial longevity gap between black Americans and say white Americans. And so that was what partly mobilized, they, they were in communities where people were dying, not only from uh, police brutality, but from COVID. They were in jobs that were putting them at risk and not paying them anymore. They were people that didn't have health care. They were living in multifamily houses in neighborhoods that were devastated. And so I do think that you have a potential for change on the back end of this. It's just, does society harness it and embrace it and decide that's one thing that they value as a change? And, and I don't know, it's not really part of Joe Biden's platform. I can imagine him expanding uh, healthcare, but he hasn't really run on like universal healthcare in a kind of well, the way that most uh, developed countries run it. So can you take that one step further, Jay? So uh, let's assume in a really good place by September where, you know, COVID is to some extent behind us. Yeah. Life resumes, you know, some semblance of normalcy. What do people like us, you and I and others on this line do to you know, keep the memory alive, the, the extreme racial injustice, the inequality that led to deaths, the you know, lack of healthcare, all those things that will all of a sudden become less ur urgent. What do we do to keep them alive? Uh, I mean, obviously there's lots. Uh, so the, the, usually that falls within the domain of people who are activists, um, but there's multiple things academics can do. So the first obvious thing is we study it and we expose it in, in, in you know, using scientific approaches. The other thing is we disseminate it. And one of the, I think one of the exciting things right now of this era that we're in is that it's probably easier than ever for scientists to have a voice in, in public discourse through social media, through writing op-eds, 
uh, and, and it seems like there's a demand for it. I'll say that one thing that I hope that sticks around after the pandemic is when I watch, I, I'm not somebody who watches a lot of TV, especially news, but I've watched a lot during the pandemic to stay in touch, but I've also been invited to do a ton during the pandemic, you know, an order of magnitude more than I have before. And when I turn on, you know, CNN or something, almost always there's a scientist on the panel, whereas, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, it was just political pundits. And so I do hope that, that scientists continue to have a voice on those forums and those discussions in the mainstream um, and, and communicate this to the public, because I think that is gonna be key. What, it's, not, it's not key, it's probably just one necessary piece of the puzzle. The other things are gonna be happening on the ground, changing policy, scientists who are gonna be advocating for policy change in rooms that, you know, of small people where they make decisions on these things. So I think it's kind of a bunch of those things, but I, I do think that we all, have a voice in it and that we should keep these things at the forefront. And I also kind of feel like within the age of social media, it's hard to put things back in a bottle once they're out. It's just like, uh, we, we seem to have a longer memory for things than we used to. On one hand, it's like the, the trending topic of the day is gone after 24 hours and someone was in the news, Hilaria Baldwin's in the news today and you'll never hear from her, you know, <laughs> again. But I think these kind of structural issues, my, my undergraduate students just seem way more informed about them than they were five to 10 years ago. And I just think that's not gonna change. Inshallah, as they say. Um, well, thank you, Jay. This was absolutely delightful. Um, much appreciated. I don't know if uh, Atif takes over from me or we declare a break. Um, maybe Nancy, you have a thought. Oh, Atif is back. Good. Yeah, that, thanks, Elder. And thanks, Jay. That was terrific. We, we have a couple of minutes and I was just thinking about a question. I'm, maybe going to put you, Jay, on the spot a little bit and make you like a political consultant of sorts. And you know, just to make it fair, you know, I'm going to have you advise both the Republicans and the Democrats, right? Um, the question you posed, one of national identity, I think it, it res just, I mean, I'm not a scientist in this field, but just resonates kind of at a very uh, um, basic level with me, makes sense. Um, what what the New Zealand Prime Minister said that said that we are a team of five million people, right? How can we build a common core or a common national identity? What would you advise the leadership of either uh, party uh, in the US? What can they do to build a more positive national identity? Yeah, I think there's lots of things. I think this is obviously one of Biden's goals uh, during his presidency. And one thing I've noticed that he's done that I think is really smart is he just never mentions Trump's name. And he never seems to take the bait of whatever polarizing issues in the news that day. He's just moving forward on his policy issues. Uh, and so I think that if you do that and you create policy change that affects people's lives concretely, you know, to Eldar's point, you know, improving their health care, increasing their minimum wage, I think those are the kind of bread and butter things that, that uh, affect people's political behavior in a, in a daily basis. So I think that, and, and then messaging and communicating in a way that role models, uh, at least, you don't have to, I think, and, and this is, a, he also had a good case with his stimulus package where he met with a bunch of Republican senators, heard them out, considered their possibility, but he decided, I'm, I'm not gonna like meet in the middle on the policy uh, because the policy is actually widely supported by the majority of Americans. So I'm gonna do, create policy that's bipartisan um, and, and, and still do these symbolic things, the meetings and stuff, but not, but always push through the policy that's popular by most people. So I think that is kind of keeping your eye on the prize uh, while also doing the symbolic things in the language he uses and who he meets with. Um, I would say for the Republicans, the key is moving beyond Trump. And, and I'll say this, it, you can imagine a very different response, say if, if Mitt Romney had been president during the start of the pandemic. And in, in fact, George Bush was his administration, the Obama administration, gave them incredible credit for having this kind of Bible for dealing with a pandemic when they took office and then they improved upon it. And so you could imagine a very different response under a different Republican administration. Of course, both of those administrations uh, had a lot of polarization, but I think to unwind it, you're going to need it at the very top among leadership. Um, someone in the comments, which I'm trying to glance at, uh, mentioned the fairness doctrine. And so I'm not an expert on media. Um, but I think the way the media covers information is going to have to be addressed. Um, I, I study social media, and I think that that's also something where the it's economic incentives for these companies, and, and there's lots of leaks and journalistic coverage of, you know, they've tried other algorithms at Facebook, and it reduces polarization and conflict in the people using it. 
but people are less engaged and they're not likely to stay on as long. And so they lose money on ad revenue. And so the economic, they're going to have to find another way to either compromise their economic incentives in the service of democracy or um, find a way that optimizes engagement without turning people against one another and, and spewing misinformation. Because I think that, you know, three point something million billion people are on uh, social media now. And so we really need to think about that. And if, if that's something that you fixed, you instantly changed the lives and the news and the way people consume political information at, at a scale that we've never seen before. So I think that's another thing that we have to keep our eye on. Thanks, Jay. That was that was uh, terrific. It's it's really a privilege that you know we can have um, people who are in this area in such important questions to have someone like you talk to us. And thank you, Elder, for uh, 